Thomas Muir of Hunters Hill. Thomas Muir, 24, August 1765, 26, January 1799, often known as Thomas Muir the Younger of Hunters Hill, was a Scottish political reformer and lawyer. Muir graduated from Edinburgh University and was admitted to the Faculty of Advocates in 1787, age 22. Muir was a leader of the Society of the Friends of the People. He was the most important of the group of two Scotsmen and three Englishmen on the political martyrs monument, Edinburgh the others being Thomas Fish Palmer, William Skirving, Morris Margaret, and Joseph Gerald. In 1793, after a show trial in Edinburgh for advocating democratic parliamentary reforms and votes for all men, they were sentenced to transportation to Botany Bay, Australia for sedition. Two years later, in 1796, Mew dramatically escaped from Botany Bay on the American ship The Otter for America. After a voyage across the uncharted Pacific Ocean, The Otter reached Nuka Sound, Vancouver Island, June 1796. The diaries of the first mate Pierre Francois Perron describe Mew's escape and voyage across the Pacific as far as Monterey, California. From there, Muir traveled to Mexico City, where he asked to be allowed to travel to California. He was imprisoned in Havana, Cuba, and taken by Spanish ship to Cadiz, Spain. Here, his ship encountered British men of war ships, and in the fighting, Muir's face was badly injured. On September 1797, the Spanish government released Muir. Weak from his wounds, Muir made his way to France by way of Madrid, Spain, aided by a French officer. In November 1797, he arrived exhausted at Bordeaux, where he was hailed as a hero of the French Republic. He then traveled to Paris, France. Muir's confidant, 1798, was Dr. Robert Watson of Elgin, emissary to France on behalf of the United Englishmen, and Muir learned of the United Scotsmen, which replaced the Friends of the People. In November 1798, Muir moved secretly to Isle de France village of Chantilly to await the arrival of Scott's compatriots. There on 26 January 1799 he died, suddenly and alone. Shortly before his death, he said, We have achieved a great duty in these critical times. After the destruction of so many years, we have been the first to revive the spirit of our country and give it a national existence. Parliamentary reform at Westminster took place in 1832. Forty years after the Society of the Friends of the People, the Reform Act of 1832 established the reform that the Society had called for. It removed representation from 56 rotten boroughs and created 67 new boroughs, so areas with larger populations had representation in Parliament and allowed a wider range of men to vote. Early Years Thomas Muir was born above his father's grocer's shop on the high street of Glasgow. His father, James Muir, was the son of the bonnet laird of Burston in Milton of Campsie. He married Margaret Smith, and they had two children, Thomas and Janet. As a younger son, James Muir had little prospect of inheriting his father's property. His family, however, had in Maidstone, Kent, relations who were prosperous hop growers, and it was towards this branch of trade that young James was persuaded to direct his energies. In this business venture, he achieved considerable success, and by the time of his marriage in 1764, he was firmly established as a hop merchant in the high street of Glasgow. Here, in the heart of the town's ancient university quarter, he settled with his wife, living in a little flat above his shop. By all accounts, Muir Sr. was a man of some education, whose interest in commerce extended far beyond that of his fellow businessmen, for he has been credited with the authorship of a pamphlet on England's foreign trade. By the 1780s he reached the summit of his social aspirations when he purchased the property of Hunter's Hill House, together with adjoining lands. Of Muir's mother, Margaret Smith, nothing of a biographical nature has been recorded. However, we do know that both Muir's parents were Orthodox Presbyterians, consequently young Thomas's early upbringing was very much within the confines of the rigid moral and social ethic of all glitched Calvinism. Thus, early accounts describe him, not unnaturally, as a pious child of modest, 
Preserve nature for 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 nature education Muir's education began at the age of five when his father hired William Barclay, a local schoolmaster, as a private tutor. In 1775, at the early age of ten, he was admitted to the gowned classes of Glasgow University. After five sessions he matriculated 1777 and took up divinity like his parents. He supported the Auld Licht or Popular Party in Kirk politics. Graduation in 1782, at the age of 17, Muir graduated M.A. Influenced by the teachings of John Miller, he abandoned his studies for the church. At the beginning of the 1783 Minus for term, he was accepted as a student in Miller's classes on law and government. In politics, Miller was a Republican Whig and a critic of the so-called benevolent despotism of Henry Dundas. His target was Scottish political conservatism in the form of the Faculty of Advocates and he brought on young Whig advocates imbued with a due reverence for the law. Muir joined students' clubs and societies in which the major topics of the day American independence, patronage, and Burg reform were debated. Expelled from university In May 1784, a dispute occurred between Professor John Anderson and other members of the faculty, including Principal William Leachman and Professors Richardson and Taylor. Senior students issued a pamphlet, a statement of fact against Leachman and the faculty. After Anderson had departed for London, disciplinary proceedings were launched. Muir, McIndo, Humphreys, and ten others were named as ringleaders. A ban was enforced on their attendance at lectures awaiting the result of hearings. Muir and his fellow students requested legal representation, but this request was rejected. Muir gave notice of his voluntary self-expulsion from the university. At the beginning of the new academic year, Muir, with the assistance of Miller, obtained a place at Edinburgh University under the Whig professor of law, John Wilb. Here, he completed his studies, and having passed his bar examinations, was admitted to the Faculty of Advocates in 1787 at the age of 22. Tribune of the People an elder of the Church of Scotland for his home parish of Cadder, Muir became embroiled at the beginning of 1790 in a dispute with the local landlords led by James Dunlop of Garnkirk, a rich owner. Muir, acting on behalf of the elders, challenged the attempt of the landlords or heritors to pack the selection committee for a new minister with parchment barons. Upon the case being referred to the Synod at Glasgow, Muir was appointed as counsel for the congregation and fought a protracted case on their behalf all the way to the General Assembly. In the event the case of the landlords was thrown out, and Muir and his party emerged victorious. Muir acquired a reputation as a man of principle. His outspoken conviction that many existing laws were biased against the poor won him the respect of younger advocates, who nicknamed him the Chancellor. His views on law reform were, however, unacceptable to members of the High Court, Lord Braxfield and Robert Dundas. Revolution in France The French Revolution of 1789 revived the hopes of all members of the Whig Party in Scotland and England in their campaign for burgh and county reform. Foxite Whigs in Parliament and the Lords inaugurated in April 1792 the London Association of the Friends of the People. Led by the Scots Lords, Lauderdale and Butchin, this society enjoyed widespread initial support from leading Whigs throughout Britain. Since 1789, many clubs and societies had sprung up in the principal towns and villages of Scotland in support of the revolution and its principles. In June 1792, the members of these societies, and in particular those at Glasgow, Edinburgh, Dundee and Perth, began a regular correspondence with the object of forming a Scottish counterpart to the London Association. By the end of June 1792, a plan of organization, principally drawn up by Muir and William Skirving, a Fife farmer, was set in motion. 
in distinct contrast to the London Association, which was deliberately exclusive, Muir and his associates, taking into consideration the vital educational differential between the working people of Scotland and England, opted for a nationwide association of reform clubs unlimited to any social class. After some initial difficulties due to the entrenched opposition of Henry Erskine, the dean of the faculty and leading Scottish Whig, the Scottish Association of the Friends of the People was formed at Edinburgh on 26 July 1792. Supported by two new publications, the Edinburgh Gazetteer and the Caledonian Chronicle, plus James Titler's Historical Register, the new movement rapidly expanded. Muir and the United Irishmen As early as September 1792, acting upon his own initiative, Muir began a correspondence with Archibald Hamilton Rowan, Dublin Secretary of the Society of United Irishmen. In this correspondence, Muir detailed the aims and objectives of the association and suggested a closer unity of action between the two movements. Other activities during this period included the formation of the Glasgow Society 3, October, and a propaganda tour of Stirlingshire, Dunbartonshire, and Renfrewshire. As a result of this tour, new societies were formed at Kirkintilloch, Birdston, Lennox Town, Campsie, and Paisley. On 21 November, Muir, having been elected vice president of the movement at the Edinburgh Monthly Meeting, called for a general convention of the societies to be held there in December. On 8 December, as the first of the delegates were arriving in the capital, an address of fraternity from the United Irishmen arrived at Muir's lodgings in Carrober's Close. Drawn up by Dr. William Drennan, originally of Belfast, its appeal to the republican and independent spirit of the Scottish people were entirely to Muir's satisfaction. However, he appears to have unwisely circulated a copy of it among the delegates prior to the first sitting of the convention. Although there was much in the address that was attractive to the delegates, Many objected to the intemperate and dangerous nationalistic language. As Muir rose in the first session Muir to present the address, he was vigorously opposed by a powerful Unionist section among the delegates led by Colonel William Dalrymple, Lord Dare, and Richard Fowler. The address contained treason or misprison of treason against the Union with England. Lord Dare in particular was against the document either being accepted or even read to the convention. This attempt to silence Muir was, however, overwhelmingly opposed, and although the address in its original form was ultimately rejected, Muir obtained permission to read it over and ended by declaring to the convention, we do not, we cannot, consider ourselves as mowed and melted down into another country. Have we not distinct courts, judges, juries, laws? To this Richard Fowler protested that Scotland and England were but one people, some four weeks later, Lord Dare, in correspondence with Charles Gray of the London Friends of the People, candidly admitted that the Friends of Liberty in Scotland have almost unanimously been enemies to the Union with England. Such is the fact, whether the reason be good or bad. Sedition Charge Near spent the days following the convention preparing a defense brief for James Titler, arrested on a charge of sedition the previous month. Robert Dundas, the Lord Advocate, initiated an investigation of Muir's movements during the previous three months. Muir, on his way to Edinburgh, on the morning of 2 January 1793, to attend Titler's trial, was himself arrested on a charge of sedition and brought under guard to Edinburgh. After interrogation before the sheriff and refusing to answer any questions, Muir was released on bail. On 8 January, Muir set out for London, to tell the reformers there of the plight of the Scottish Association. The trial of the French king had changed attitudes. Both Charles Grey and Lord Lauderdale were now considering giving up the campaign for parliamentary reform. Muir went to France hoping vainly to persuade the French leaders to spare the life of the king. He met personalities of the National Convention including Condorcet, Rizat, Marebau, and Madame Roland. While in Paris, he also met Thomas Paine and Dr. William Maxwell of Kirkconnell, the future doctor and associate of Robert Burns. With the outbreak of war, with France the anti-reform party in Scotland became increasingly militant, 
and Dundas advanced the date of Muir's trial from April to 11 February. Learning this, Muir drafted an open letter stating his intention to return as soon as passport difficulties would admit. Dundas set in motion legal steps to ensure Muir's outlawry for non-appearance on 25 February 1793, when Lord Braxfield pronounced him a fugitive from justice. Transportation On 6 March, Henry Erskine convened a meeting of the Faculty of Advocates, at which Muir, with no one to speak in his defense, was unanimously expelled and his name struck from the register. At the end of June, Muir obtained a passage from Haver de Grace in an American ship, the Hope of Boston. Disembarking at Belfast, he made his way south to Dublin, where he was fated by members of the United Irishmen, attended their meetings, and was sworn in as a full member of the society. He spent a week with Hamilton Rowan at Rathcoffey, then decided to return to Scotland armed with masses of literature and letters for Scottish Republicans. Landing in Port Patrick on 24 August 1793, he was immediately arrested, brought under guard to Edinburgh, and incarcerated in the Talbooth prison. On 30 and 31 August, he was brought before Braxfield to answer charges seditious speeches, circulating seditious publications, e.g. the rights of man, and reading a seditious document in public, viz. the United Irishman's address. The judge seized on Muir's connection to the ferocious Mr. Rowan Rowan had challenged Robert Dundas, the Lord Advocate of Scotland, to a duel and on the United Irishman papers found in his possession. He was sentenced to 14 years' transportation. The reform movement then stiffened their resistance to government coercion. Muir was removed to an armed cutter, the Royal George at Leith Roads. There he was soon joined by Thomas Fish Palmer, who had received a sentence of seven years' transportation in similar circumstances at Perth. Skirving resolved to convene a new convention, better organized and more representative than its predecessors. Sundas reacted by ordering the immediate removal of Muir and Palmer to the hulks at Woolwich, ahead of their departure for Botany Bay. The Third Convention Journey and Arrival in Australia on the 1st of May 1794, the surprise convict transport sailed from Spithead St. Helens for Sydney with Mir Palmer, Skirving, and Margaret on board. The French Admiralty, by order of the Comite du Salut public, sent out frigates to attempt their rescue, but the surprise sailed with a strong convoy of East Indiamen and some of His Majesty's ships, and it does not appear that they ever sighted the French frigates. The surprise reached Sydney on 25 October 1794. During the long voyage out to Australia, an attempt was made with or without official connivance to discredit Muir, Skirving, and Palmer by implicating them in an alleged mutiny led by the first mate. This affair, however, was so badly bungled that, in spite of having to endure much harsh and brutal treatment at the hands of the captain, the reformers had little difficulty in refuting the evidence against them upon arrival at Port Jackson. Confinement at Sydney Cove, Sydney Cove Muir's term of confinement at the penal colony appears to have been fairly uneventful. As political prisoners and men of talent and education, he and his associates were accorded far greater freedom of movement than ordinary convicts. Prior to their departure from Portsmouth, each had received a considerable sum of money raised as a subscription on their behalf among the wealthy London Whigs. By this means, they were able to sustain themselves without recourse to the official colonial stores and thereby keep free of the compulsory manual labor normally demanded from all dependents. In November, Judge Advocate Collins records that, records that, the lieutenant governor, having set apart for each of the gentlemen who came out from Scotland in the surprise a brick hut. In a row on the east side of the cove, they took possession of their new habitations, and soon declared that they found sufficient reason for thinking the bleak and desolate shores of New Holland not quite so terrible as in England they had been led to expect. By December all four had spent the bulk of their remaining cash in purchasing plots of land. Skirving and Muir both seem to have acquired the services of sometimes served convicts as servants. 
Palmer purchased 100 acres 40 hectares of land for 84 pounds and was soon waxing eloquent about his new occupation as a farmer. Unlike his companions, or indeed his father, Muir had little or no taste for farming, and with an eye to ultimate escape from the settlement, he purchased a small hut and several acres of land on the opposite side of the bay. Muir's farm was located in the area that is now Jeffrey Street in Currably. By this means he was able to remove himself from the direct observation of the governor and his soldiers, and at the same time was provided with a legitimate excuse for keeping a small boat. Early in 1796, with the assistance of Pierre Francois Perron, a French sailor, he succeeded in arranging his escape from the settlement on board the American maritime fur trade ship Otter of Boston. Some accounts state that Muir's rescue or flight was not the first of such escapes may be judged from a remark of William Robert Broughton, Royal Navy, who sailed from Port Jackson in HMS Providence, 13 Oct 1795, we abstained from following the example of other ships that have touched at this colony, by not taking away any of the convicts. The captain of Otter, Ebenezer Dorr, had, however, made it a precondition of his part in the escape plan that Muir and any who chose to go with him should effect their own escape from the harbor at Port Jackson, as this was carefully guarded by a blockading frigate. Muir swiftly contacted his fellow prisoners. However, in the event, none but himself was able to go. Skirving, who had suffered from a recent bout of yellow fever, was too weak, and would shortly be dead. Gerald, who had recently arrived in the settlement, was in the final stages of acute tuberculosis, and the Rev. Palmer, who was nursing him, refused to leave his charge. Only Margaret might have availed himself of Muir's plan, however he was absent, at a farm deep in the hills at Parramatta, and, in any case, he had been sent to Coventry, i.e. exiled by his former colleagues, because of his part in supporting the mutiny allegations. Escape to America On the evening of 17 February 1796, he six Muir, together with two convict servants, loaded up his small boat with one day's provisions and stealthily rowed their way out of harbor. Hugging close to the shore, they successfully eluded detection by the watch on the frigate and navigated their way towards their prearranged point of rendezvous. About 12 a.m. On the following day, wet and exhausted, they were hauled aboard Otter. Muir, who had been unable to bring with him any of his personal property, left behind a note giving his books and papers to Palmer, with whom he also left a letter for the governor thanking him for his tolerance and stating his intention of practicing law at the American bar. After a highly adventurous voyage across the as yet largely uncharted Pacific Ocean to Vancouver Island, Otter finally dropped anchor in Nootka Sound on 22 June 1796. The chronicles of Pierre Francois Perron describe Muir's escape and the voyage across the Pacific and as far as Monterey, California. In conversation with Jose Tavar, the pilot or master of the Sutil, a Spanish vessel at anchor in the bay, Muir learned to his dismay of the presence in neighboring waters of HMS Providence, a British sloop of war under William Robert Broughton. This vessel had visited Port Jackson shortly before Muir's escape and, since he had almost certainly become acquainted with the captain or members of the crew, his life was now in real danger. To be captured while under sentence of transportation meant immediate execution. Once again Muir's extraordinary luck held out. While a student at Glasgow, he had acquired a fluent command of Spanish, and he was now able to persuade Tavar. Changing vessels, he sailed with Tavar down the coast of California. On arrival at this important Spanish outpost, Muir was introduced to the governor, Don Diego Borica, who was favorably impressed by his character and intelligence, and allocated him accommodation along with his own family in the Presidio. However, when Borica in due course submitted a report on Muir to his superior, the viceroy at Mexico City, matters took a turn for the worse. Ignoring Muir's request to pass through Spanish territory to the United States, the viceroy instead ordered the severe disciplining of Tavar for violating his orders. 
Muir's use of Washington's name and his claims of friendship with many of the leading personalities of the French Revolution had rendered him highly suspicious to the Spanish authorities. Accordingly, Borica was directed to have Muir conducted with all haste to the capital without open sign of his being under arrest. Accompanied by two officers detached from the governor's staff, Muir, after a grueling and often dangerous trek across the mountains, reached Mexico City on 12 October. For some days he was held in detention and closely questioned as to his purpose in entering California. It is evident, however, that his explanations were disbelieved by the skeptical viceroy, who resolved to ship him out to Spain as a suspected spy. Under heavy guard, Muir was now dispatched on the road for the port of Vera Cruz, where he arrived on 22 October. In spite of his demands to be put on board an American ship, he was now shipped out to Havana, Cuba, to await the departure of a convoy for Spain. Return to Europe For some time, Muir appears to have regained his liberty in Havana, for he spoke to several American merchants explaining his plight. He also appears to have attempted an escape, only to be recaptured and imprisoned for three months in the dungeons of the La Principia fortress. However, Muir was nothing if not resourceful, and it was while he was in La Principia that he succeeded by some means in contacting Victor Hughes, the French agent for the Windward Islands. On learning of Muir's situation, Hughes wrote to the Directory in France, thus providing them with the first concrete news of Muir's escape and survival. He also wrote an indignant letter to the governor of Cuba protesting bitterly at Muir's harsh treatment and demanding his release. However, by the time this letter arrived in Havana, Muir had already sailed for Spain. Whatever misgivings or fears Muir may have had for his safety at the hands of his Spanish jailers, there was one danger which had not occurred to him, that of confrontation with a British fleet. On the morning of 26 April 1797, as Muir's ship, the Ninfa, approached the entrance to Cadiz Harbor. He was confronted by several Royal Navy men of war who for some weeks had been blockading the port. Seeing at once that a conflict was inevitable, Muir approached the captain and asked to be put ashore as he was unwilling to bear arms against a ship which almost certainly contained some of his fellow countrymen. The captain, however, faced with the likely destruction of his vessel, had no time to consider the feelings of a prisoner. Turning about, the Ninfa and her sister ship the Santa Elena headed up the coast, hotly pursued by the British ships. After a chase of some three hours' duration, the Ninfa and the Santa Elena were engaged in battle opposite Canal de la Frontera. In the action which followed, the Ninfa was seriously damaged, while the Santa Elena, reputedly a rich bullion ship, was deliberately scuttled by her captain. During the last few moments of the engagement, Muir received a glancing blow to the face from a piece of shrapnel which smashed his left cheekbone and seriously injured both his eyes. One of the crew under interrogation appears to have revealed the fact of Muir's presence on board, and a careful search was made for his body. However, the Spanish captain insisted that Muir was among the dead, and in the event he was so badly disfigured that his would-be captors failed to identify him, and he was sent ashore with the wounded. Now began a long and painful recovery, while the French and Spanish authorities, from consular to ambassadorial and ultimately at ministerial level, indulged in a bitter diplomatic wrangle over Muir's release. The last days in France. Finally, on 16 September 1797, the Spanish government relented and decreed Muir's release and perpetual banishment from Spanish territories. Still weak and emaciated from his sufferings, Muir made his way to France by way of Madrid and San Sebastian, aided and assisted by a young officer from the French consulate at Cadiz. In early November 1797, he arrived exhausted at Bordeaux, where he was hailed publicly as a hero of the French Republic and a martyr of liberty. Fated by the civic authorities and literary societies, his last portrait, commissioned for display in public buildings, shows him with a large black patch over his left eye. The loss of his left cheekbone had caused that side of his face to droop, revealing the teeth in a perpetual grimace. Muir, weak and half-blind, 
slowly made his way north to Paris, where he arrived on 4 February 1798. Muir's arrival in the capital was heralded by a great outburst of popular adulation. David, the great French artist and propagandist, was officially appointed to welcome him to the city, in a front-page eulogy, in the government journal Le Moniteur. From the very outset, however, Muir made it abundantly clear to his benefactors that, flattered though he was by their attentions towards him, it was their intentions on behalf of his suffering countrymen which were now to be his chief concern. He associated with Thomas Paine and James Napper Tandy of the United Irishmen, from whom he learned the exciting news of the near insurrection in Scotland over the Militia Act. During 1798, he submitted many letters and memoranda to the Directory urging them to intervene militarily on behalf of the people, and thus aid them in establishing a Scottish Republic. Muir's chief confidant and informant during 1798 was Dr. Robert Watson of Elgin, emissary to France on behalf of the United Englishmen. From him he learned for the first time details of the strength and extent of the United Scotsmen, the new revolutionary association which had replaced the friends of the people. From Watson he also learned of the impending arrival in Paris of James Kennedy of Paisley and Angus Cameron of Blair Athol as delegates of the new movement. Since Muir was by this time the principal intermediary between the Directory and the various Republican refugees in Paris, he was aware that his movements were under scrutiny by Pitt's agents. Accordingly, in his last known communication with the Directory in October 1798, he requested permission to leave Paris for somewhere less conspicuous, where his crucial negotiations with the Scots emissaries could be conducted in safety. Thus it was that sometime in the middle of November 1798, Muir moved incognito to the little Isle de France village of Chantilly to await the arrival of his Scots compatriots. There on 26 January 1799 he died, suddenly and alone, with only a small child for company. So close had his efforts for security been that not even the local official knew of his presence or identity. No identifying documents or papers were found on his person, and his name was discovered only when the postman remembered delivering newspapers to him addressed to Satoyan Thomas Muir. When several days later the news of Muir's passing finally reached Paris, a brief obituary notice was inserted in Le Moniteur to the effect that he had died from a recurrence of his old wounds. Shortly before his death, he said, said, he said, we have achieved a great duty in these critical times. After the destruction of so many years, we have been the first to revive the spirit of our country and give it a national existence. The Political Martyrs Thomas Muir was the most important of the group of two Scotsmen and three Englishmen commemorated at the Political Martyrs Monument, the others being Thomas Fish Palmer, William Skirving, Morris Margaret, and Joseph Gerald. In 1793, these men were also sentenced. William Muir, er, you Muir, or you Muir, or you Muir, Muir, or Muir, or William Muir, the Campsy poet, was a relative of Thomas Muir's. Thomas Muir was also a cousin of William Muir, 1767-1843, a shipowner and merchant living in 1798 in Altona. Denmark, now part of Hamburg, Germany. Thomas wrote, asking William to remember him to his Thomas parents, who lived in Bishopriggs. The letter was kept by William Muir and found in the loft of his William Muir Bond 9 distillery. Muir had relocated. Ref. Christina Belai, Muir of Hunter's Hill, P.G. 175. Thomas Muir was buried, not in the old Chantilly burial ground, but outside the graveyard of the church in town, as he was not Catholic. As of 1971, this graveyard had been covered over by a parking lot. Source, groundskeeper of Old Chantilly Burial Ground, who said people often came looking for Thomas Muir. He knew all the people in his graveyard, and Muir was not one of them, but had died alone, Come Clochard. Site visited by Janet White, 1971, a descendant of William Muir. Honors, 